Hi there, and welcome to another video. Today, I'll be starting this series called Uncovering Academia, in which I look into different studies that I'm interested in, usually in f the finance or economics realm, look into different studies and try to pull out real world implications from those studies and present to you. Thank you for watching and let's get started. And today's topic will be what I call the love-hate relationship between Main Street and Wall Street. We all know there's a connection between government and business. The, the connection is well known, but to what extent? What does it cover? Does it affect a company's investment plans? Could there be a trading strategy involved around it? And can local and state economies actually stimulate growth? With that in mind, let's look into a couple of studies. So one study that caught my eye um, is titled Political Uncertainty and Investment Casual Evidence from U.S. Gubernational Elections. It's by Candace Jens, um, part of a dissertation paper I, she did a couple of years back, where the main question that's being asked here is, does a firm's future plans for investment and behavior, just in general, change when there is high uncertainty in the politics of a given state? If it's a battleground state or a state that can lean either way for for governor, for example, does it really does it really affect a company's plans? Does it affect its capital expenditures? Does it affect its research and development? Um, how they plan to employ people going forward? Um, it's there's been effects shown in international companies, especially for the possibility of um, just the state taking over the company is so, could it still be that bad in the US? And can even politicians manipulate the investment of different firms to influence election results? And just all these different thoughts. The methodology used, which I never knew about, but sounds pretty interesting, it's called a difference and difference model, which is you view a situation before um, an event, and you view a con control group that you believe has similar characteristics, and you see how things diverge after an event. So, just a pure hypothetical here. This hasn't happened, but I'm from Houston, and Dallas is right there. And let's say they're driven by the same economic indicators. Oil prices plays a major role. Um, s similar demographics. Let's say Houston raises its minimum wage. They have the same minimum wage, for example. I don't know if this is true or not, but for example, they have the same minimum wage, so say $9. Houston raises their minimum wage a dollar to 10 an hour. So you study how these two economies moved maybe three to six months before that change, and then you st look at three to six months after that change and see what changed, what happened, what's expected based on what happened in Dallas versus what actually happened in Houston. So it's an interesting way to look at different pro problems, kind of as a benchmark or a yardstick. Conclusion on this study is, on average, there's approximately 5% decline in firm investment in states with a gubernational election when compared to firms in states without an upcoming gubernational election. Now that, I mean, it doesn't sound like that's that much, but in context, I mean, that's, out of 20 billion, you had a $20 billion budget, that's 1 billion less not being invested or unsure what you're gonna do about. I mean, in a lot of states, that's a lot of money. I mean, that can be hundreds of jobs. Um, that can be a new plant, new facility, new locations. Just, it means a lot for on a state level, which is what this study is looking at. Farm investment incrementally increase after an election. So if things go as planned, especially if the incumbent is reelected, things kind of go back to status quo, then the firm investment goes almost goes back to normal, but not 100%. Also, sm small companies, politically sensitive companies, which includes co really any company that has a law that's really connected to it. So alcohol, guns, some natural commodities, and asset-intensive firms. They are the ones that are most affected by anything that happens um, in the political realm. 
And although there is some effect, it's not as it's not nearly as I won't say as bad, but not nearly as drastic as it is in other countries, um, Argentina, Colombia, Malaysia, etc. So just in general, I, I mean, politics, even on a state level, and I'm can even imagine on a local level, can really affect a firm's long-term investment plans. That's what I pulled out of this study. Next up, does policy uncertainty affect mergers and acquisitions? It was by Alice Honeim, um, Hussein Gulen, cannot pronounce these names, don't, don't get mad at me, and Mia Ion. Let's just go with that. Um, didn't mean to offend any of these professors. I mean, I've, I believe this was a very good paper. It really got me interested. I just can't pronounce the names. But their key research question was, how does different policies, public policy, affect m and activity? I mean, does it have any effect on taxes, government spending? Does that, does that play any role in m and act activity? So that was kind of the, the thought process. And the statistical method used, once again, did not know this existed, was vector autoregression model, which is actually something that um, I want to say, um, is it IML or that? I want to say it's IML, but one of the larger economic institutions in the globe, they use this method, this model. And what it essentially is saying is, we're not sure if X causes Y or Y causes Z or Z causes X. And there's just all these relationships. We're not sure what's causing what, what's the independent variable, what's the dependent variable. So we're just going to compare it all. We're just going to mash it all up and then interpret the results. It's, to me, it's similar to what makes a team successful. Is it the coach or is it the players? Um, in the NBA, um, to me, the biggest one that sticks out is Phil Jackson. Uh, was it always his players? Did he know how to get a hold of his players? Or was the, or did he just coach great players? Was it really him or was it you had Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant? And what was done is they compared m and activity to what's called the BBD index. And this index is a weighted average of factors that attempts to quantify political uncertainty. Included in this index is the number of articles related to policy uncertainty in major U.S. newspapers, any possible tax code changes, um, any future monetary policy disagreements. We hear that a lot with the Fed going on now, as well as any future fiscal policy disagreements. You know, I mean, we're, we're going through that now with the Trump being elected. I mean, is international trade going to be affected? I mean, that's, that's the one that come to my mind just right off the top. The conclusion being there is an inverse relationship between policy uncertainty and m and activity, which was to be expected, to be honest, but to uh, what's the details behind that? High uncertainty leads to a decreased amount of deal value, the number of deals, and a decreased chance of a merger wave. And what is mean by that is usually in, in an industry, consolidation usually happens over maybe about a, anywhere from a six to 18 month span. If you look at different industries where mergers are happening left and right, that's what tends to happen. Nobody just buys a company out of the blue. Usually it's, oh, they bought somebody, I need to buy somebody to keep up. Also leads to mergers for vertical integration to be more likely. As in, you don't want to depend on other companies to get, get things done. So you might as well just buy them out and just keep everything in house. And there is, and this is to me the most important thing, there isn't any mean reversion. Deals aren't lost. I mean, deals are lost. They're not delayed. I mean, that's to me, that's the biggest thing. How can this not be viewed as a big deal um, to me. I mean, if you've ever been through like the M&A process, one thing you notice is once people walk away from the table, they walk away from the table. Like they don't want to come back. Or they see a company that had a failed M&A process as damaged goods and don't want to mess with it. So it plays a big role. Policy affects the M&A space just to the utmost level. Next study Government spending, political cycles, and the cross-section of stock returns. Very interesting study. 
by Federico Bello, Vito Gala, and John Lee. Found in the Journal of Financial Economics. The research question here was, how does the presidential cycle through government spending affect the stock market? We all know there's four key parts to GDP. You have consumer spending, you have business investment, you have international trade, and you have government spending. That's the key one, government spending. That's being looked at here. So how political parties influence expected cash flows of firms and are asset returns influenced by government spending itself. So in, in this particular paper, the statistical method used was called an input-output analysis. So in a way, it's similar to the VARS model I've shown, except you can clearly understand if X is causing Y and Y causing X. You can see the interdependencies. So a clear example is using coal to produce steel as well as using steel to produce coal. Like they kind of depend on each other. The conclusion found in the study is that firms that depend the most on government spending are most affected by presidential cycles. Once again, it's an expected result. But the key to these academic studies is what's under that initial conclusion, what's under that initial result. There's the, the layers behind it. That's where the real um, information is found. So during a democratic presidential cycle, firms with high exposure to government spending significantly outperform low exposure firms by about 6% a year and underperform by negative 5% a year in Republican presidential cycles. Which is very interesting. I, I mean, never thought, never truly thought about using that as a trading strategy. As in, oh, if if Hillary would have won, or and while Obama was in office, maybe I should look more into government contractors, for example, as a in, uh, as a as an investment strategy. The effect is strongest in the second and third year of of a presidential cycle, and I'm assuming that's when the dust set settles and things start starting to be enacted. And investors believe that higher government spending equals higher profits for high exposure companies. And it does come to fruition. It does happen. So maybe investors have something there. And there is a relationship between government spending and volatility of a firm's profitability. So you see the, the, the relationship there. And essentially, public policy directly affects Different sectors, financial results, and stock returns. So the stock market is paying attention. One study that I found really interesting that just popped out to me, um, maybe on a smaller business level, let's not look at corporations so much now, is Federal Home Loan Bank Advances and Small Business Lending. Um, study by Travis Davidson and Gary Johnson in the Journal of Entrepreneurial Finance. The research question had to do with an act that happened in 1999. And the, the goal of the act had really nothing to do with small business lending. It had, if I'm not mistaken, had more to do with just um, mortgages and houses, like uh, as usual. But there was a little clause in there that allowed more lending to small businesses um, through these um, federal home loan bank advances. So did this lead to more economic growth? And does the results differ from, differ before the financial crisis, crisis uh, versus now? And I mean, that was that was kind of the thought. I mean, we unsure. So methodology used here was a series of regression analysis. It's the classic um, statistical 101, if you've ever been in a class um, for statistics. I mean, does X, Y, and Z, do they affect A? I mean, how many things really affect this one um, this one factor. I mean, you could you clearly know the relationship, or you at least have a thought process behind the relationship. The conclusion found here was there is a positive link between the change in federal home loan bank advances and the change in small business loans. I mean, the more advances um, these these banks got from from the Fed, the more advances they received, the more loans they were willing to give out. But there's there's more things under there. The higher the amount of federal home loan bank advances, the more loans given to small businesses. 
However, the proportion of small business loans doesn't grow for a bank's portfolio, even if the federal home loan bank advances are a higher proportion of a bank's capital. Which is suggesting banks were starting to sit on these loans. They got the money, they got the capital to work with, but they're not using it. And apparently this was a bigger deal after the financial crisis, which is understandable. So policy actually can affect a small business, which is more important, small business access to financial capital. Very big implication. Last study I will present today is government policy towards entrepreneurial finance and what's called the Innovation Investment Fund. Um, it's a study by Douglas Cummings, or Cumming, sorry about that, in the Journal of Business Venturing. Actually an older study, but I found, I still think it's very apparent, especially since similar things are being done to today in the United States, which is, does government-backed funds and programs, this one in Australia, help stimulate economic growth? I mean, and comparing the results of these government-backed funds across different countries, um, government-backed funds in Canada, Israel, UK, and the US. Once again, statistical method was used was a series of regression analysis, and the conclusion was that the Australian IIF, which is Innovation Investment Fund, had significantly contributed to the financing of early stage companies, which is the whole purpose. I mean, IIF is training the future VC managers in the country, which is very interesting. I didn't, I couldn't 100% understand that, that, but essentially what's going on is the IIF had their own type of entity that was separate from other venture capital firms. And usually if somebody goes to work for government, that means they weren't the best in a private enterprise. That's not always the case, but in this case, it was more so they bring in younger people who probably wouldn't have a chance in the VC world. They're bringing in younger people and they're able to meet certain criteria and make things happen and get businesses going and really spur economic growth that way by directly trying to profit from it. And so that these enti this entity as well can work with other private equity, I mean, other venture capital firms. Very big deal, very big deal. So in conclusion, there are some implications for long-term local economic growth based on public policy. Public policy does play a role. And I know there's a lot of, and to extent myself included, free market advocates out there um, that believe that government should just stay out the way. But there are some ways the government can help. Public policy can help take economic growth to the next, to the next level. Now, how I would like to contribute to the literature some studies I would like to look deeper into or at least try to research more. Um, first is more connections between public policy and the financial health of companies in different industries. So to me, that's looking at the effects of Obamacare on small and medium-sized businesses where they probably didn't have a health care plan in, in place or they didn't really require have that requirement, but because it was required by Obamacare, you know, how did it affect their, their financial, the financial health of the company? Um, any connections between intellectual, pro I mean, intellectual property and business performance? Does that really matter? Does that really help? The relationship between disposable income and different companies in more cyclical industries. I mean, you have retail, um, restaurants, the disposable income matter? Is there any other in economic indicator to keep in mind? Regulation D and its effect on the venture capital industry. Very important, very, very well known, but not really talked about. You know, how much did it really affect the VC industry, especially allowing angels to really step up in, in the space? The importance of international trade policy to domestic business, usually not thought about. Um, and possible connections between weed and economic growth. I mean, if you, I mean, they can collect taxes on it. It's a very big deal um, in, in America now. I mean, people are starting to not be so hard on it. I mean, starting recreational use. I mean, why not? As well as other things I want to look into, um, the influence of government-sponsored entrepreneurial programs on local economies. Now, this doesn't have to necessarily be a venture-backed 
type of deal. Although I know some local com- economies are doing that, but just trying to spear entrepreneurialism just in the area. Just have more entrepreneurs in in a city or in a state in general. And this is something that's pro- that came actually more from a Freakonomics topic than any study. But you know, look at universal income. I mean, could that really help with economic growth? I mean. We'll be paying attention to Finland. They have something coming up similar to in that space. So, hey, just something to look into. Thank you so much for your time. Hope you got something out of it. If you have any any particular topics you would like me to look into or that you're interested in, especially in the financial and economic space, let me know. I'll take a look. Why not? It's what I'm here for. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video.